I'm Bryce Johnson. Uh, I lead, I'm the inclusive lead for Microsoft devices, so I get to work on hardware accessibility. Um, and you know, I think it's it's really coming to GA Conf is really like summer camp for me. All my friends are here. Um, you know, I get to see people I never see. It's uh, really kind of wonderful. Um, before I get started, I actually want to warn people. Um, there's videos in this presentation. There's a lot of videos. Um, and Shell asked me to basically, you know, make sure that I tell people that there's a lot of videos in this presentation. I'm going to do my best to describe the videos and the imagery that you kind of see. Um, but you're all probably wondering why I have this button up here of Zach Morris. And, you know, if, it, if most of you will not get this reference, this was from a show in the 90s called Saved by the Bell. And... I have this here because we shorten the name Xbox Adaptive Controller really often to Zach. And basically, um, John Porter, who's someone I work with at Microsoft and I, like calling it Zach Morris. And it's really just that. It's really self-indulgent. We think this is hilarious. We've always, we've tried to get Zach Morris to like catch on as the name of the controller. And it's really just us two. So <laughs> this is one of the things that, uh, you know, this is, this is probably the height of the weirdness, but we'll, uh, we'll kind of go from here. Um, I really, really want to thank the people on this slide because they're here today. Um, all of these folks helped us develop the Xbox Adaptive Controller, you know, and, and worked with us before we launched it. There's many people who helped us. These people are actually here today. Um, at least Mark was here earlier. You know, I, will, I really want to make sure that we thank Mark and Chris from Able Gamers. Um, we, they brought us about 20% of our beta testers um, through player panels. So when they talk about player panels, 20% of the Xbox Adaptive Controller beta testers were given to us by Able Gamers through, through the player panels. That's more than our internal employees. And so when you think about a company that uh, has like 100,000 employees, the fact that like Able Gamers brought us more testers than we had internally is really impressive. Um, then there's Cherry. Cherry's also not in this room, probably because they all know me. And they're all like out there. And they're like, ah, it's Bryce. I get it. Um, Cherry actually didn't find out about the controller until GA Conf last year. Um, but she's on this slide because Cherry shares so much of her experiences that we didn't actually need to tell her about it for her to actually influence the device. Um, and, and it's really important. Like she's, she's so amazing at sharing her experiences in such an articulate way. You know, we couldn't have had this slide without her. Um, Liz is on this slide. Liz is from Special Effect. They're a charity that we worked with in the UK. Um, special Effect are always very important to us because while they're one of our great partners, um, it, they brought a, a sense of how they work, which is different enough from how we do things in the US to really kind of show us that how important that is. And, and since then, we've actually gone out to a bunch of other countries. We've gotten uh, partners in France and Israel as well. Um, then there's Ian, well, because it's Ian, you know, I'm really, you know, Ian. Well, I'll just say Ian, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's really it. Um, Aaron, Aaron from Craig Hospital. Um, Eric, she's right there. I made her sit up front. <laughs> and, and what, you know, when Aaron came on board with the adaptive controller, it was at a point where we heard from a lot of advocates, you know, and we heard from a lot of people who were adjacent to the medical uh, field as in occupational therapy. But Aaron came on board and basically told us, you know, what you're doing, like she, she basically cut through a lot of, this, of the, you know, the crap that we kind of had to deal with and told us how they do it in, in Craig Hospital. And they've been running game nights with their patients for years. So her wisdom and experience was invaluable. Um, it, it, and the work that we did with Craig really affected a huge amount of our team. Uh, last one there is Eric. You know, does anyone, did anyone meet Eric today? Yeah, yeah, Eric. So Eric comes to us from Warfighter Engaged. <laughs> Um, you know, they were a great partner. They were with us from the very beginning. Um, my story about Eric is actually kind of funny. So last year at GA Conf, like, we were all here. And, um, you know, we were about, a f I guess, six weeks away from announcing the controller. And at lunch, just like lunch today, because this was in the same building, um, you know, there were lawyers wandering around, basically listening to see if people were, you know, breaking their NDAs. Not to, like, punish them but just to hush them. <laughs> and so everyone's looking at Eric because, you know, they think Eric's the guy that's like gonna like, you know, 
spill. <laughs> but you know, it ended up actually being, there's only one person that talked, and it ended up being someone from Microsoft Marketing. So the, sto <laughs> so the moral of the story is, it's always marketing. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, hardware doesn't get credits. Here are the credits. These are all of my colleagues that worked on the Xbox Adaptive Controller, and I really need to take the time to publicly and enthusiastically thank them all. Um, we would not have done this, and if you looked at this project when we started it, it, it really felt like it was impossible. But the passion and the dedication um, of all these people, um, you know, going above and beyond, um, really kind of made it happen. Um, here's a photo of the, most of the original hack team, um, and Matt's around here somewhere. Um, so that's, you know, us in the Inclusive Tech Lab, and we're, you know, this is after the launch. It was really cool to kind of get back together. Actually, three of these guys in this picture um, aren't at Microsoft anymore, so it was really cool to kind of bring them back and uh, celebrate, um, you know, with all of them. We all have the, we're all holding signed controllers. Here's one kind of close up. Here's a picture of the controller close up, signed one. So, we've been extremely fortunate to have heaps and heaps of accolades and overwhelming goodwill sent our way because of this work. Um, this is a picture of an award we won at an internal Microsoft Accessibility Conference. Um, again, I like this picture because it shows a lot more of the team. Um, this, this award is actually hanging in the Inclusive Tech Lab. Uh, this picture is kind of really special. Um, for me, um, the accolades are amazing, they're great. Uh, and it's funny, because you know, I was a designer on the launch of Xbox One. I am not used to praise, right? <laughs> that is not my deal. Like, Reddit is not like, Reddit is not fun for me. Um, I, I think the thing that I kind of want to take from this picture is that we really need to keep laser focused and vigilant on what we're trying to do here, you know? And so while I appreciate the accolades, I really crave constructive feedback. So when I get it, and I've gotten it lots from people in this room and from the whole world, it's really, really important to us. All right, that's most of my self-indulgence. Um, this tweet was actually sent to me from Ian. It's by uh, Dear Ms. Hashim, um, and it says, today we watched and rewatched and reflected upon this Microsoft commercial with first grade. Here are some of their thoughts. Some kids cannot change. It doesn't mean they can't play. Microsoft did not want the kids to change, so they changed the remote. It's tagged accessibility inclusion. Yep, they nailed it. A plus, that's the deal. That's pretty much the mission statement. You know, like that's pretty much why we did it. Um, and so it's great that people are kind of understanding. And we started our journey in 2015 um, this is Sergeant Josh Price. Um, him and Ken Jones came to visit us from Warfighter Engaged. Um, for those, Josh is a wheelchair user with one hand, and we met them, and they showed us how Josh plays. They came to campus and kind of figured it out. It was really powerful for not just like the people on the team, but like the entire Xbox hardware leadership, because a lot of those folks are veterans. And when they saw how this specialized rig empowered Josh, and what he'd be missing out on if he couldn't game, it fundamentally changed how we looked at controllers. It was that powerful. So here's a picture of my youngest daughter. You can see her, uh, her nail polish is, needs some work there. <laughs> um, she's holding a Minecraft Creeper controller. And we had to start from a place of recognizing how controllers excluded people. Um, I think we make the greatest controllers in the world, but when we look at them through the lens of exclusion, you know, we make a lot of assumptions with game controllers of how people are gonna use them. You know, we assume that you're gonna have two thumbs for, to use those sticks, you know, that you're gonna be able to have fine motor control to hit all of those buttons. How many buttons are on an Xbox controller? Does anyone know? 21? Nope. Four close, six. close. Four, <laughs> 46, that's a great. <laughs> 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 so, 
So there's, there's 17 buttons on an Xbox One controller. Unless you count the sync button, then there's 18. Um, but, uh, you know, you get at all of those buttons with four, with two thumbs and two fingers. That's how it's designed, right? That's really dense. That's denser than a keyboard. Um, this device has been optimized over many generations. And, and you know, it, like I said, it makes a ton of assumptions. So the other thing it assumes is that you have the reach with those index fingers to get around to those bumpers and triggers. And it also assumes that you have the endurance to hold it for long gaming periods. And sometimes that's a hard thing. That's one of the hard things that it actually was, was tricky to explain to our engineers about. Like, you know, we would say, well, sometimes people can't hold it. It's too heavy. And they're like, what are you talking about? I hold it for 15 hours on Saturday. You know, and we're like, yeah, you, great. But, you know, not everyone can hold this thing. So understanding um, that when we recognize these assumptions and that these the, you know, that the controller was throwing up these barriers, it was really important to kind of how we worked. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Game bro voice. Sweet. <laughs> that's very cool. So once we, once we recognized this stuff, we went out into the world. We'd, we'd already met Warfighter Engaged. Um, we engaged with Able Gamers, um, the Cerebral Palsy Foundation, Special Effect, and Craig Hospital. And like I said, the, they're all here, they were all here today except for the Cerebral Palsy Foundation, and I'll bug Richard Ellison about that. That's really funny that he was the only one not here. Um, but uh, these partners were kind of invaluable to us. Um, they all have very similar goals and missions and what they're trying to do. Um, but the fact that they all approach their work differently and uniquely um, was unbelievably powerful for us. Um, and that, was, that shaped the device really frequently, like really, 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 really significantly. So, you know, this device had to work as well for Warfighter as it did for Special Effect, as it did for Craig. And, and that, was, that was how we, that was, those were the constraints that we were under. So we created a lot of prototypes. Um, I'm, the, I'm not going to show you all the prototypes because, not because they're a secret, but the first ones were just really terrible. You know, like we, we, we went in some weird directions. Um, you can, you can see it later. <laughs> you work, you work here. Um, so here's a picture of two PolyJet printouts, um, of basically early versions of what became the adaptive controller. Um, they have a lot of uh, pencil markings and marker markings on them, and there's a little measuring tool beside it because the designer who, who does this really likes that stuff. He likes it, makes it look cool. Two different sizes. Um, the general form of the device really started from a place um, of the ports here on the back. So on the back of the device, there's 19 ports. I know I said there's 17 buttons, but there's two extras. So there's 19 ports on the back, and once we figured out that we wanted people to be able to plug in um, independently to all of these things in a very comfortable way, it really determined the size of the device. Um, that's, that's genuinely where we started from. The, the, the ports and the way that people kind of would attach them to them basically meant that we knew this device was gonna be this long. Um, so from that, once we knew we, that it was gonna be that long, we started to think, well, what else could we add, right? We knew we needed to have some buttons, so we added these two big buttons up the front and basically these other things because, well, for a couple reasons. We wanted people to be able to navigate the Xbox dash with just this device, so you can. You can navigate just the dash with just, just this device. Um, and we wanted to give two big buttons because, you know, the reality is, is we know that buttons are not, you know, they're not, in ex they're, they're, they can be expensive. Um, so we wanted to provide some really some value. We wanted to provide something that the gamers didn't have. Um, so we, we put two big buttons on the top. Um, one of the things that was really interesting for us was that we didn't, at first, we didn't really assume that people would actually play with this like, as a part of their rig. I mean, I think some of us did. We all had different levels of where we thought how people would use this. But I think the industrial designer and some of the engineers really thought like this was um, kind of like a hub 
right? You'd plug stuff into it, you'd put it away. So one of the things that's interesting about it is the width of the device is actually the width of an Xbox One S. So that's how they kind of thought about it. They thought about it kind of with your Xbox One S. But after visiting Craig, like our industrial designer and um, our user researcher, you know, they really changed how they thought about how people would use this device. So at first, this device didn't have this slope. So I'm holding it sideways and you can see there's like a bit of an angle. Um, and the reason why they put that in was because, you know, people want, needed to rest their hands on the table and still press these buttons. Um, and while we couldn't make it really, really thin because of the ports on the back and because of the fact that these big switch buttons actually require some room, we could make it sloped. And so we sloped it so that people could rest their hands on it on the front edge. So here's another polyjet. Um, this is actually really close to, the, uh, to, the for, to the, what the actual device kind of came to be. And I think the one thing about this picture that we want to point out the most is that we needed to make sure that there was adequate white space between the buttons. Some of the earlier prototypes, we had the buttons basically with zero white space between them. And what we saw from a lot of people was we saw a lot of accidental activations, right? Like people would be hitting buttons they weren't intending to hit. And that was really important for us to kind of fix. Um, so they left room around those buttons. And the other thing that they figured out from that is that if you couldn't press these buttons, the industrial designer Chris Kajowski likes to talk about how you could kind of lay your hand on this device and just kind of rock it between these two things. And if that's, if that's how you kind of want to actuate these buttons, that works really well. So, so you've seen this picture, I think, today already. Um, so this is a photo of the Xbox Adaptive Controller um, with some of its friends. Um, things like the quad stick and the Logitech 3D Pro, um, some AbleNet switches, our PDP one-handed joystick. Um, that pedal, which we actually use a lot, which I don't, I don't know exactly what it's for. Some people say sewing machines and some people say like, uh, like, um, t like courtroom stenographers. I think that's another thing that it could be used for. Um, either way, we plugged it in, works great. Rock band pedals work great too. Plug those in, they work fine. So if I haven't made this clear yet, this is a game controller. And I mean that very literally. The Xbox One and Windows 10 do not see this any differently than any other game controller. Um, and, and that's, and I totally get why that's sometimes really challenging for people. Because it looks so different from what we traditionally think of as game controllers. Um, but just to kind of go through this again, um, the functionality of every button on the device can be exported to a switch. You can come see us at our table later. We'll show you what that is. A switch is just the term for like a button. Um, it's like all buttons are switches, but not all switches are buttons, if that makes sense. <laughs> you know. So there are two USB ports on the side one for each joystick, and each one of those USB ports will accept the first eight buttons um, of that joystick. And we picked eight, we just, we needed to pick a number, so we picked eight, <laughs> you know? <laughs> that was really kind of it. Um, there, I have uh, one of the things that uh, Logitech sent me, um, they sent me a farm simulator, like full driving rig, and you can plug the, co the console, the center console of the farm simulator rig into the Xbox Adaptive Controller, and it totally works. It works great, but the, that thing has 26 buttons and we only use the first eight, <laughs> you know? So, you know, we had to pick a number. Um, here's a picture of the Xbox Adaptive Controller next to an Xbox One S and our, our typical standard controller. Um, one of the things that we learned early on as well, um, Richard Ellenson from the Cerebral Palsy Foundation really drilled this home, and we talked with Aaron about it, um, was this idea that it was really important for us that the form of the device felt like a proper Xbox device, that it belonged in the family of Xbox hardware. And when we talked to people about their assistive technology, you know, we often got a lot of feedback like, uh, I don't like it. And it's because most assistive technology out there in the world is overly medical looking or it infantilizes you. It makes you feel like a child. So with this device, 
we didn't want to stigmatize people from using by using it. It was really important that this felt like a member of the Xbox hardware family. And that was, uh, that was such an important piece of feedback for us. Like, while we, we wouldn't have made a device that didn't look like it was part of the Xbox family, having that information early enough in the cycle was so vital to how we sort of frame this that I really do feel like it, it made a lot of difference. Um, and, and since then, I'm getting a lot of teachers that basically reach out to me where they have kids in their classes that want to, that need to use assistive technology and they want to know if the Xbox Adaptive Controller can kind of work in their classroom. And the reason is, is the kids want to use it because it looks cool and they'd be cool if they used it, right? It's something that the other kids don't have. That's cool, not weird and othering, right? So, you know, there is so much there that I think as an industrial design team we can look at and, and any other type of design, um, not stigmatizing people from who use your product. Okay, I get this question a lot, and this whole section's for Ian, because he really wanted it in here. Um, how do I design for the Xbox Adaptive Controller? So for all you game developers in the audience, I get this question a lot. How do you design for the Xbox Adaptive Controller? And here's my answer, please don't. So what does that mean? <laughs> Chris, Chris hinted at this earlier in the day. Prescriptive guidance, I mean, per, I don't really like giving prescriptive guidance. Um, you know, I've been a designer most of my career. Don't tell me what to do, tell me what the problem is, right? So I try to like frame it from this point of view. Where I want people to ask these questions. Like, can your control remapping be as unique as your gameplay? So, we do system level controller remapping with the Xbox Adaptive Controller. We do it on for, for regular controllers too. But simple remapping um, in those senses is a safety net, right? We do that for our customers, it's important. Having contextual remapping for your game is really the best way to go. Um, what unique game assists can tune your gameplay for individuals? Um, I am overwhelmed with how much we've talked about this today. <laughs> and it's amazing. It's amazing that we're all on the same page of this idea of using like assists to tune games, you know? Would secondary action facilitators hurt gameplay? So I'm gonna give you a couple examples of this in a minute, but I just kinda wanna leave that one out there for you. Um, this is one that we explore a lot in our inclusive tech lab. Um, can you have fun with simple controls, maybe not compete, or maybe not master, but can you have fun? That's, that's the question. Um, is precision vital to progression? You know, that's something that's really interesting. My example there is sniper versus shotgun. Um, are simultaneous actions required? Um, we've seen a lot of great examples of that today too, where like people have had bypass loops and things like that. Um, there, simultaneous action can be a real barrier for a lot of folks. Um, you know, please try to not, not do that. Can inaccurate timing be forgiven? Um, and better yet, can it be flexible? Can, it be, can timing be tuned to an individual? We've seen a lot of examples of that as well. All right. So here's a video of Minecraft. Oh, creeper. <laughs> so um, Minecraft has some really great control remapping. Um, just kind of let it get in there. You can remap every control in Minecraft. And the thing about Minecraft is that Minecraft's played across every device in the world. They have to have like kind of some great control remapping. Um, there are more actions in the game than there are buttons on the controller, so you can give choice, right? You can basically say what you want to choose and what you don't. I think another thing about Minecraft, oops, I went too slow there. Um, another great thing about it was you might have seen me set an accelerator, which is auto jump. So um, in Minecraft, you can set the game to auto jump and then you don't actually have to physically jump. Perfect little accelerator. Think of, think of people who can't press buttons repeatedly and now they don't have to, right? Just to move around. Fortnite has some great options in their accessibility menu. Um, I'm not gonna talk about any of these. I'm gonna, talk about, uh, I'm gonna talk about this one that happens on console, which is Sprint by Default. Um, 
This is an amazing kind of small feature. It's really important because again, it goes back to that simultaneous action thing. I can turn this on and I never have to press that thumbstick to actually run. You know, I press the thumbstick to walk. It is, the game assumes that I'm running. Um, that's a great accessibility feature. Um, I know someone who plays Fortnite specifically because of this feature. Her name's uh, Melly. Um, she's in Germany. Um, she just got a tattoo of the controller. <laughs> like, that's, wow, it freaks me out. But Melly's amazing. Um, but without this feature, she couldn't, she can only use one stick. Like, she can use one thumb stick. So what she does is she actually has a button that she puts between her knees, and that button is mapped to run forward. So when she puts her knees together, her character in Fortnite runs forward. And if she didn't have this sprint forward, she'd have to like either figure out a way to have two buttons pressed at the same time, which, which can be done. Um, but you know, th this just makes it so much easier for her. All right, this is a soccer pitch. I guess you guys can probably can guess where this is going. Let's talk about FIFA. I'm not much of a FIFA guy, you know, unlike millions of people in the world. Um, but FIFA has had some really amazing controls for a really long time. Um, Karen, was it FIFA 20, was it 15? that two-button mode got it entered into? I'm not sure which version, it's been around a while. Yeah, so two-button mode in FIFA has been around a really long time. It's really powerful. Um, you have a one-button mode. And yeah, and I was just gonna say, and this year they put in a one-button mode, which is amazing. So they've even gotten even better. And the greatest thing about FIFA, um, there's a lot of really good assists there too. Oh, this volume wasn't supposed to be this high. I don't know what I was doing here. This is basically <laughs> indicative of like my FIFA playing. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm gonna just cut that off because I don't want any of us to get sued. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna describe this picture. Oops, oh, I'm going a little s slow. Let me actually rewind this. Oop, go back, forward, pause, I'm gonna pause. Okay, so one joystick says move, one button says grab, one button says jump. Um, this is inside. I love inside. Mwah. Two, one joystick, two buttons. It's the whole game. You know, um, it's amazing to see what happens here. I sped this up because I kind of messed up this part. So <laughs> you see me running up that wall. Um, you know, it, it really is a great example of when, how simple controls can really be compelling. It's kind of why I wanted to have it in here. Here's my youngest daughter in front of a Xbox adaptive controller and a monitor demonstrating something we show in the Inclusive Tech Lab, Rocket League with no hands. She has a foot pedal to accelerate and she slides her leg between two buttons. Um, and she uses those two buttons. Um, she hits them with her knee to basically um, turn left and right. Um, there is an articulated arm on the chair, um, attached to the, uh, to the chair. And on that um, arm is a, a button. Actually, a button that Aaron recommended I get. <laughs> so, um, and that button is for jump. So while this is not the entire controls of Rocket League, you can basically play Rocket League with no hands in this thing. And we set up this demo in the Inclusive Tech Lab primarily because it's a really good way to not only demonstrate to people who, are, are, um, who don't understand like, what accessibility is, but it's, it's very approachable. Um, a lot of the rigs that we would set up in the Inclusive Tech Lab um, were very realistic and they were very intimidating. So um, that was something that we kind of learned really early on. Um, Rocket League has some amazing controls, uh, control remapping. You can remap acceleration to uh, left stick. So you can basically drive the car with just the thumbstick, um, which is really, really quite amazing. And I can show you that later. I'm Canadian, so I'm playing hockey. <laughs> um, does anyone, was anyone here la last year talking, uh, um, this is Jason Conum's uh, game, Way of the Passive Fist. Um, there's some really amazing articulate work in here where he has tuned the difficulty settings specifically to his game. Um, and it's really powerful stuff and it's also really simple and it really makes a big difference. Um, so it's wonderfully customizable. So we have to talk about Celeste. How do we not talk about Celeste? Um, so it's interesting that Celeste introduces its assist modes at the very beginning of the game. 
Um, and the developers have been clear that you know they weren't really they didn't really believe in assist modes, but they really knew that they had to do it. You know, they felt like it was super important to them to put it in, but they but as game designers, they didn't want to do it. Um, so this is the assist mode. You can change game speed, infinite stamina, 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 stamina. Uh, air dashes. You can set to infinite, and you can turn on invincibility. So I really admire the developers of Celeste for basically understanding that this might not be for them, but that they should do it anyway. You know, that's really, really, really powerful. All right, let's talk about Shadow of the Tomb Raider. There's some amazing, and we've talked about it today, there's some amazing accessibility settings in there. They're really fantastic. Um, that really tailor the game to you. I, I particularly love, like, you can change weapon aim from right stick to left stick. So it's, it's possible to play the game with one, with one thumb stick. It's great, it's wonderful. Um, and then you can also, obviously also to change the, a lot of the repeated presses that, that Tomb Raider was known for to single holds, things like that, or other way around. I don't know, I'm forgetting right now. Um, but like the difficulty menus in here are amazing. Um, the fact that you can tune all facets of difficulty is something we've heard from the community a lot. Like don't make the bosses easier to fight, just make the puzzles easier. Don't make the puzzles easier, make the bosses easier. So that ability to tune um, things for you is really, really powerful. Five minutes. Sorry, Tara. Uh, don't worry. I'll, I'll be on time. I'm almost done. So let's go back to these questions. Can your control remapping be as unique as your gameplay? Um, Rocket League did a really amazing contextual job. That's, you know, remapping acceleration to thumbsticks is something we couldn't do on a platform level. That's something that game developers have to do. Um, you know, making unique assist modes for your game. That was pretty much all of them. And everything we talked about today um, around assist modes and how important that is. Would secondary action facilitators hurt your gameplay? Auto jump in Minecraft. Does that hurt? Probably not. Auto sprint in Fortnite. Does that hurt? Nope. You know, let's figure that out. Um, can you have fun with simple controls and not necessarily compete? Um, back to Rocket League. We play Rocket League all the time with just simple, simple controls. Inside is simple controls. Those are good examples. Um, I don't really have one for this precision and vital to progression, but you guys get it. <laughs> uh, simultaneous actions required, you know, um, Shadow, Shadow Tomb Raider did an amazing job at, at addressing that. Um, you know, really stellar. And can inaccurate timing be forgiven and can it be flexible? Um, Celeste. Celeste, you can change the timing of the game, right? That's really powerful because there's some people out there that don't necessarily want the game to be easier. They just need a second. Right? They just need a little bit more time. Like, I've, I've heard people say to me, like, I want to play Dark Souls. I don't want to change it. I just want it a little bit slower because that's what their reaction time is. So, look, Tara, I'm early. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's sort of our journey. And it's funny because I think, like, it's part of our journey. We still are learning so much. Um, Aaron and I have a talk on Thursday. We're going to go into a little bit of other stuff. So if you want more... Thursday. But uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>